Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and this is the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 130. My guest today is Joe Fitzpatrick, who works here. Uh, we're going to talk about travel photography, so stay tuned. First of all, I just want to let you know, though, if you are in Florida, uh, drop everything and come to the FCCC con convention. It's Florida Camera Club Council Conference. <laughs> it's March 8th through the 10th, 2019, so it starts today. Um, and we've got a great lineup of, of speakers, including me and Joe Fitzpatrick. We're going to be talking at the convention and it's amazing. It's a very world-class convention, so if you can make it, come on down. We still have some openings for some of our Understand Photography tours. Um, the Forgotten Coast, which is the Apalachicola Panhandle area, we've got a few openings for that. That's in May. I can't remember the exact date, sorry about that. Uh, May 2019, Joe Fitzpatrick leads that, and we love that area. It's really old Florida. There's the old cypress trees and the Spanish moss, and there's white squirrels and rusted trucks and rusted boats, and it's, it's just really, really cool. So look on our website, understandphotography.com, for that. And then our ladies' only tour to Tuscany is about half sold out. That's in September of 2019, end of September, early October. So check that out while you're on our website as well. So today we're going to talk with Joe Fitzpatrick. Now if you guys don't know who Joe Fitzpatrick is, I'm very surprised because he has been a part of this show since the beginning, hundred and well two and a half years ago. <laughs> Um, he's been at Understand Photography for almost 10 years. He's our lead instructor. He's also the president of the, camera, the Florida Camera Club Council, which is the statewide umbrella group of all the camera clubs in Florida. He's an amazing photographer. He's one of those people who is really technical, but he can explain things simply, which is a nice, nice combination. And he's a really nice guy, so welcome, Joe. Hi, glad to be here, Peggy. Nice to see you on this side of the camera. Yeah, it's a, ch <laughs> it's a change. Hi, Heather, how's things going over there? I'm usually back over there where Heather is. One day they'll get to see what Heather looks like. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to do that. We'll have to get her into a shot. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about seven steps to better travel photography. So. First step is what? Manage? Well, manage your expectations. Uh, you know, the, if, if you don't manage your expectations up front, you can wind up being disappointed even if it's a fabulous trip. Okay. And the first thing to manage is, is what type of trip is it? And this is where people wind up very frustrated. Are you going on vacation with your family and friends who are not photographers? Or are you taking a photo trip uh. where the primary reason for going on the trip is to take photographs? So if you're going primarily to take photographs, should you go with your family? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, unless, not unless your family are all photographers. I mean, this, this is the thing. You see this so much. Uh, if, if you're going on a, a regular vacation with, with friends and uh, a spouse or significant other who's, who's not a photographer, you're going to be frustrated and they're going to be annoyed. You're going to be taking pictures of stuff and you're going to feel rushed all the time because you've only taken 20 shots of this thing, you know, and they're going to, which is, you need a lot more than that. You know that. I mean, you've got to wait and get more shots. Well, you've got where to they're going to, from different angles. Well, sure, you're going to be doing all that stuff. And they're going to be wondering why in heck you need more than one shot of this stupid whatever thing is you're taking. So you're going to feel you're rushed, and they're going to feel you're taking forever, and nobody's going to be happy. And they're not going to want to get up with you before dawn. No, exactly not. To get but the we'll best talk light. about that a little later. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But, you know, so if you're going to go and it's not a photography trip, then don't take a lot of gear. Okay. And don't plan on taking a lot of photographs. Enjoy the trip. Enjoy your friends. And, and do the tourist thing. And if you get a chance, take a photograph. On the other hand, if the purpose, if you're going with a couple other photographers, like a lot of the trips we go on, you and me, we have friends, and we're all photographers. So it's a photography trip. Well, and that's a whole different thing. I have a friend with the same name as you. <laughs> <laughs> Might be you who says that he won't travel with people who are not photographers. <laughs> exactly, yeah, because he gets frustrated. So, so if you have a group that's all photographers, then you can take your equipment and you can plan on spending the time you need at different spots. You can plan on being there when the light is right. 
you know, and this is the kind of thing you want to do. So you can, you can manage the trip better and your expectations are going to be different and you're going to be planning on getting shots in this kind of a situation and you're going to have the opportunity to do it and you should be able to carry the gear with you you need to do it. You know, if you're going with friends and a couple people, you're not really going to be able to do much more than maybe have a point and shoot or your single lens or something because it's, the stuff's going to get in the way if you're just traveling on a, on a regular tour or something like that. You're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah. But if you go with photographers or you go on a photo workshop, it's a whole different story. There you're planning on taking pictures. Well, maybe you could compromise and just say, hey, just this, this afternoon I'm going to go and... Uh you know, yeah, go come. off on my own yeah. or well, whatever. You, work, you can work around the tour. This is another way to do it if they're non-photographers, especially if you're on one of these planned tours, you know, like tour to Italy or here oh, or like there. like if you're on a bus Yeah, tour if you're on something? a bus tour, usually they don't leave particularly early in the morning. Yeah. So what you do is you plan on getting up before the crowd, mm -hmm. go take your shots in the morning, have it planned in advance where you want to go, what you want to shoot, Go there, get your shots, and then be back and join everybody for breakfast and enjoy the day. And then at the end of the day, depending on what time sunset is and how much light you have, whether it's winter or summer or where you are versus the equator, maybe you'll have an hour or two at the end of the day where you can take some more photographs and do it that way. And that way you'll have the best of both worlds. You'll get your photographs and you'll be able to enjoy the companionship of your friends too without either party getting feeling annoyed or frustrated. <laughs> So that's step one, is manage your expectations, right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is it manage? I guess that's right. Yeah. So what would step two be? Would well, that would be research and planning. Okay, well, that's a pretty big one. This is, this is a huge one, and this is the make or break. Now, for most of this, we're going to be discussing that you're, the purpose is photography. Okay. Okay? So, so let's keep it that way. So you want to do research. Obviously, you've already picked out where you want to go. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, well, then that's research in itself, you know, <laughs> yeah. figuring out where you want to go or, or something like that. But I'm sure mostly you have an idea, oh, I want to go here, I want to go there. So you've, you've decided on a location or a general area where you want to go. So from there, you want to start planning what is the shoot there, what is the best time of day to do that, uh, what do I miss, and everything else. So the first thing I would do would be get on Google. I mean, Google is a huge resource. Mm -hmm. So you get on there, and I type in 10 best photo spots in wherever it is I'm going. Okay, and you'll come up with some. And you have to watch when you put that in, because sometimes you wind up with the 10 best places to take wedding photo photographs. You get a lot of that. So you got to be specific and do some different searches. And you'll, they'll give you a suggested list of places in that general area. Mm -hmm. And you can get real specific about that. Uh, one time I wanted to do some night shooting in Miami. So I looked up and I came up with the 10 best spots to photograph at night in Miami. We had the guy on the show. I can't, Eden, 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 yeah. Eden and I come up. He's really good. And Everywhere I come up, he goes, I, I, he does 10 I, I, I come up with Eden's uh, website for Miami and it was fantastic. Now I knew about half of them, but there were a couple gems in there that I had no idea were there and that was great. So I got a, uh, a great clue on some places to go in Miami at night to get some shots. And you could do that anywhere. So you go and you research. Now there's going to be good sites and there's going to be bad sites. But every once in a while you get lucky and you find one like Eden's on a place and that's really tremendous. So you do that. You look at websites places to go. Uh, go on 500px, go on, go on Instagram, uh, all these different Pinterest. photo Pinterest, all these different photo places, even Facebook to a certain extent. And look at the images on there. You know, Google, uh, type in in the search wherever it is you're going, and then start looking at images and see what appeals to you. And usually in the image it will tell you where it was taken or give you a general idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If it doesn't, contact whoever took the picture. Oh, They'll probably idea. be pleased to hear from somebody, you know, I loved your picture, where did you take it, I'm going to go there, yeah. you know, and maybe it's a local photographer, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you'll hook up with a photographer there that can take you places that, that, that did that picture, so that's a possibility too. So do this kind of research, look at the images, see what you enjoy, find out where they're taken, make notes on that. Another thing you can do is 
you go now the next thing is lighting for there okay and there you have uh, google earth to give you an idea of which place google earth can show you whether a place faces east or west or north okay. or south or whatever uh, we did that the first time I went over to Viscaya in Miami, if you recall. Mm -hmm. We were going to go over there and look at Viscaya. So the first thing I said is, well, what's the best morning or afternoon? So we looked on Google, and I saw which way it faced, the, the particular side of the building I thought was most interesting, and we determined whether it was in the morning or afternoon shoot. And we just did that by looking on Google. Now you can get a little more elaborate than that. You can get a... Uh, you can get an application for your phone, Photographer's Ephemeris or Sun Surveyor, which I like to use, mm -hmm. and they will and actually... Photo Pills, I think, does does a little bit, but a little different. Now, Sun Surveyor or Photographer's Ephemeris, those you can roll forward to any given date in any given location, yeah. and it will tell you what time the sun comes up, what time it goes down, and you can get an idea when it, it'll put an overlay on a Google Earth map Mm -hmm. showing you where the sun is at any time of day and which direction the shadows will fall. That's awesome. So you can get in there and with that it's awesome. You can really figure out when's the best time on a given day to be there. Now those are both apps, they both cost money, right? Yeah, they're, well I think there's a free version of Sun Surveyor but I'm not sure what's not included. Okay. Okay. And photographers ephemeris, I'm not sure if they have a free or it's just a paid version. But we're talking here less than 10 bucks for these things. Yeah. For the information they give you, it's invaluable. I like uh, Sun Surveyor 2. We'll show you the Milky Way. And it'll show you when the uh, center of the Milky Way is above the horizon for how long it is. And it'll also tell you how the moon will impact the, the Milky Way shot. So okay. that's pretty cool for that too. If night photography is in your plans for where you're going. That's a very useful program for that. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so you can get these things and you look, and the only thing you have to watch is make sure you're in the right year and the right time of month <laughs> and the right location. <coughs> uh, you know we do the photo walks, and I'm laying out a photo walk for, for here in, in Naples, a sunset one. So I'm down at the location I want, and I pulled out my app, and I looked to see where, the, and we're planning it a month ahead of time, so I looked yeah. to see where the sun would set, and I said, oh, it'll be perfect. It won't be in back of this building. It'll be over here a little bit, and it's going to be great. So the next month, we have the photo walk, and it was immediately obvious to me the sun was going down right in the middle of the building. Uh -oh. And I hadn't used Sun Surveyor since then, and I looked at it again, and I realized I hadn't reset the, I don't have an auto automatic location because I don't want the GPS uh -huh. constantly on. Uh -huh. And I hadn't reset it, so the location was up north or someplace. Wow. So, <laughs> so that didn't work out. <laughs> so this thing, you know, operator error gets into everything. But uh, they're great apps if you use them right and pay attention to what okay. you're doing. Okay. So, so you have that you can look at. Uh, online forums. Okay. Almost every location you can think of that where more than four people have been there, uh -huh. there's an online forum for How do you it. find them? I would just do a search for whatever the location is. Uh, I used to go to St. Martin a lot, and there's a forum on St. Martin. And you just go on I, there. I never run into forums. I don't, yeah. I don't see how you're... Yeah, you just... You just do it. Do you just put the word forum in there? For forum for... For like... Wherever it is, and you'll come up like with I'm one. I'm going to the Moravian Fields yeah. this summer. Yeah, And then there are general travel forums, too, that, that aren't specialized in a particular location. And they may be... Uh, travel Talk Online is one. Okay. And, and they may have a group dedicated to here or there or whatever. I see. And then the people... And that's... People that go there are on there that are experts there. You know, you get people to go back to a place every year. Maybe they live there. Yeah. Maybe they have a business there. Yeah. You know, so they're doing a little bit of self-promotion too. Uh, and you can go on there and you can ask questions. What's this? What's that? What's going on? And they'll tell you things. And they can also tell you when's the best time to go somewhere. Uh, where's a good place to eat? Where's a good place to do this? Right. And a lot of that. Of course, like I say, since some of the people on there may be commercial, yeah, uh, keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> but but mo for the most part, you don't see that much because the other forum people will keep them in line. Yeah. You know, yeah. unless they are good, they're going to be bashed at it. So the online forums are a really tremendous resource for information from people that go there all the time, people that have been there. And you'll see other people asking questions. They may be asking a question that didn't occur to you. Right. That's valuable right. to you, too, you know, because a lot of that, you don't think to ask something. 
But after you get there, you go, I should have asked about that, yeah, but I didn't even of think of it, you know, especially a foreign country. Things are so different sometimes, yeah. and it may be something that you're used to even asking, you know. Yeah. If you've never been outside the United States, you want to occur to you to ask what kind of electricity they have, right. what voltage they have, right. you know, where if you've done any traveling, you realize that that's important. It's important to know. <laughs> Especially yeah. for a photographer. Yeah, we exactly. need to charge our gear. Exactly. So, so there are <laughs> questions you might pop up on a forum that then occur to you that are useful too. So I find the forums very useful. If you're going to get on forums, do it as soon as possible. So you get in there and you start participating and you get a lot of information from them. Oh, so I think great, that's, a, yeah, that's a that's a really good. good that's a really good source. A lot of people don't use it. But I know it's great. I've used the TripAdvisor forums, but you know, they're not photography forums yeah. for one. Yeah. And sometimes they have good advice and sometimes mm -hmm. they, they're pretty useless. So yeah. you never know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, all this stuff, uh, the internet is, is, is such a good resource these days. I mean, in the old days, the only thing you had was go to a library or a bookstore and get books on it or something like this. And your information was very limited. Yeah. And that's still a good resource because there's still some good travel books you can get on destinations uh, that may have a lot, not so much photography oriented, but uh, best places to stay, eat, uh, transportation, things like that. You can get like a photos book or one of the other ones that has all this kind of useful information well, that's good to take with there you. There are people who, who put together guidebooks really? as well. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Because I know, you know, we went to Acadia yeah. National Park last year, and I exactly. bought you the book, and then yes. you bought another an e-book, right? Yeah. yeah. Of course, you and I put together That's a correct. guidebook for this area right. for um, ah, Naples and Collier County and yeah. the Western Everglades. So I find these guidebooks invaluable Absolutely. when I'm planning a Absolutely. trip. I, it's like I'm going to buy the book because I want to know where the photographers go. Yeah. So what else with research? The best book I ever had, though, was one... And this is years ago. I bought this book on Maui, and it was about the size of our, of our book, maybe a little smaller. And I don't remember the name of it, but the guy, he gave you mile markers on the road and said, stop at this mile marker 30 feet down from it, get out of the car, climb over the fence that says no trespassing, walk down 100 feet, look to the right, and there's your view of the waterfall or something like this. The book was fabulous. Oh, so see, there's I, all these little gems. I didn't gems. put any of the no trust no, I mean, stuff it, in our you book. Know, but, but there's, there's, you know, there's little gems too. So sometimes it pays. Go to your bookstore. They yeah. still have bookstores. You oh, know. Well, yeah, Amazon. Well, you yeah. can always go to Amazon. Well, I mean, you go to the bookstore and you can look at the books. So you yeah. can look in here and there. Or you can go to Amazon, the same thing, yeah. and look at them there. But there's a lot of good information out there. There's a lot of bad books too, though. So it oh, would be better yeah. to... Yeah, Absolutely. Because I, I forget some... I, I've bought guidebooks before. That's actually why I, there's a lot of guidebooks in the Everglades and mm -hmm. some of them are not very good. This one, we put the coordinates in, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what's, what's the right time of day to go, yeah. what's the right time of year to go, what's it good for, is it good for portrait photography, nature, mm -hmm. wildlife, whatever. So, and that ebook that you got for Acadia, you really liked yeah, too. Yeah, that was good. So, both the book, both the print book that you got me and the ebook were very valuable between the two of them. Mm -hmm. They both had different strengths and weaknesses yeah. but it was really good yeah so um and then of course i guess you need to figure out where you're going like the money and the electricity and whatever else exactly like you know rate, you know what what kind of currency they're using uh, uh europe now is almost all in the euro so that makes it a little simpler than it used to be but not in the czech republic they don't well, have the euro <laughs> well western i'm going what, there <laughs> western western europe okay western U okay europe, but Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, uh, South America, all these places are all different currencies, and it, it's wise to find out what you what you and have. And find out, a bit, like, you know, we just went to Cuba, and everybody said, oh, should I bring Canadian money? Should I bring Euro money? Because, you know, there's mm -hmm. an extra tax on right. American money. But it would cost them more money to do it that way. So, yeah, it depends you know, on what you have. If you have you're, to do a little research on that kind of stuff, yeah, too. Uh, you always want to buy the money in the country where it's made. In other words, you, you don't buy your well, euros here, you buy them and you make the exchange over there. Yeah, but I don't know if I agree with that because I want to go with money. Yeah, well, I, I, I want to have some money I with wouldn't me. Buy, <laughs> I, I wouldn't but you're buy, I wouldn't get a lot of it. Yeah, yeah you, you want to get the lion's share, you want to go to a bank over there, yeah. not a exchange thing at the airport or something like right. that. You want to go to a regular national bank of some sort and you get the exchange there, you'll get the best exchange rate.
Okay. If you're talking large quantities. Of now course, today, mostly everything is credit cards. So I know. And make yeah. sure you have a credit card with no foreign transaction fee. Yeah. That's a real important one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to a different country, there's a custom form that you suggest, and that is, what, 4457? Why, why do you suggest that? Well, what, what that form is, uh, that form is just a record. You, you list on that form all your camera equipment, your lenses, anything with a serial number you're taking. Okay. And then you take that to the customs agent, uh, usually at an airport. You can call and make an appointment and go in there. You take your equipment in and the filled out form. And they will certify that, yes, this is your equipment. It's here in the U.S. And this so solves a problem. If you go somewhere like Japan or China or someplace where they make this stuff, and you come back and the stuff looks real new, oh. they may want you to pay the import duty on it because they think you bought it over there. Oh. So it's difficult to get around that. But if you have this form, this form says all this stuff. So when you get to the airport, you should get there early and go, where do you go? No, I wouldn't do it the day of. Oh. I would, or do you, how do you? I, I would make, I would get my stuff together, download uh -huh. the form online, uh -huh. fill it out with all the serial numbers and all, and then call up the customs at the airport and find out when somebody would be available to do it for you. So you should have to make two trips to the airport. Just one. Oh, oh yeah, but you only do this once. And then that, that form is good till you buy more equipment. Oh. You don't have to buy it every trip. You, you have the form mm -hmm. and it's stamped and everything. It doesn't go oh, I see. out. Okay. So you just take your equipment. And you can take it to any local airport. Any, any international, international airport. International, anyone that has customs at it. Okay. Or it doesn't have to be an airport. It could be a port too that has customs. Oh. Anywhere, where there's a, anywhere where there's a customs okay. agent to, to do it. Okay. Any, okay. Any, any, any international port, there's a customs agent. You call up. And you have all the seals number already written down. They appreciate that because if they're going to have to stand there and write them down, they, they you get know. annoyed. <laughs> so you, you have everything listed, and everything, and you have to take the equipment too because he's verifying that okay. yes, this is this. So you're okay. going with your equipment, fill that form. There's no charge for this, and then he just puts a stamp on it, and then you have it, and then it's good okay. forever. And then if you want to add equipment, you can always go and take a second form and put more equipment on and go when you have that. Okay. But it can save you a lot of hassles if you're coming back from somebody. Now, my equipment never looks new, so, ah, you know. Mine neither. Mine's so beat up. <laughs> but, I mean, a lot of people, their equipment looks like it just came out of the box yesterday. Yeah. It may even be in the box. So you can run into problems because you have to prove that, that you didn't you buy it. Yeah, yeah, that's not easy to and, do. And what they may do is they may say, okay, well, we'll either keep it or you pay us the, the tax and you'll get it back eventually when you prove it. And if you don't have receipts or something, you're out of luck. Yeah. Now, when you go to the airport, you know, when you go to the customs agent, you don't have to have receipts or anything. Just, you just have to have the physical the equipment in the form. You don't have to have receipts to back up that you bought it and okay. all that stuff. Right. So that's a useful thing to have. Okay. Yeah, that sounds you know. really good. Yeah. All right. So when you get to your location, is there anything else you need to Yeah, think about I would or? I would consider research and planning. You know, you do all this research and planning and you say, "Oh man, I want to photograph the front of this building or church, you know, church, let's say. I want to photograph this church." And then you you plan on going, "Okay, I had checked everything. The best light on this church is going to be 5:30 in the morning from across the street." So you wake up early and you go out there to the church at 5.30 in the morning and you find out the entire thing is scaffolded out because they're repainting it so you don't have a shot. <laughs> so what you do is when you get over there, well, I suggest the first thing you should do is find a tour bus or a tour trolley or whatever they have that drags everybody all over the place. Hop on, hop on. Hop on. I love those but things. I'd, but I'd hop on. I wouldn't hop on. i just hop on it. Don't even bring a camera. Yeah, just bring maybe a notepad if your memory's not so good or, or your phone to remember where you want to go. And you'll know the places you wanted to go and you can scope them as you can go past. And also looking around, you may say, oh, wow, that's cool. I like that too. So by going there, you'll make sure that the stuff you want to photograph is in the condition you expect it to be. Okay. Looks like you expected it to be. And you're also probably going to scope out a few new things that you want to add to your itinerary. So I love taking the tour the first day I get there just yeah. to get a game plan. 
The next thing I can do is, if I'm staying at a hotel and they have a gift shop, I'll go down the gift shop and I'll start looking at the postcards. Because ah. the postcards may have some great, you know, have some nice pictures on them. Oh, I like this. So you take it, you turn it over, and it tells you where it was taken. Typically, they tell you where it, what is on the front. So now you have more information on that. <laughs> ask, I'll get it. Okay. Ask the, uh, the people at the hotel, the concierge, the doorman, uh, about places. They're there. It's their business to know where to go, what to do for all different kinds of people, whatever your tastes are. So talk to them. Get information from them. Get information everywhere you can. Okay. You know, especially the people involved in the tourist industry know the spots, so you get information from them, especially out of the way places. They may have a tip. All right. Okay. So planning is a big, big part of your... Planning is a huge part. Now, let me just tell you something that you didn't mention that I do okay. <laughs> almost everywhere. All right. Not everywhere I go, but many places. I hire a guide, a photography guide. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do. We do that for a living here. But um, now I'm doing a joint uh, photo tour of Tuscany yeah. with the guy that I hired to take me around Tuscany because mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. was amazing and he lives there. He's a photographer. He knows what time. He knows what's going on. It was just amazing. It was just fabulous. Yes, it's expensive. But to me, it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. Well, it's, it's not expensive when you look at what the trip costs you to go there. Yeah. And you're looking at, I mean, if you wanted to get real technical about it, you'd say, okay, this trip is costing me so much an hour for while I'm there. Yeah. When you figure the airfare and the this, that, and the other thing. And to waste part of that, just blindly groping around looking for a place, that money he's charging you, if you look at it from that standpoint, is dirt cheap because yeah. he's allowing you to maximize the time you have that you spend a great deal on that time. Right. So. Yeah, I, you know, and, and they're all different. Like he was expensive, but he was worth mm -hmm. it. Um, but I went to New Mexico yeah. and I hired this other guy and he was amazing and he was too cheap. I actually gave him more money because mm -hmm. he was way too cheap. <laughs> because he just took me to some amazing spots that yeah. I would never have known about. Mm -hmm. So. That's that's part of my planning is hire yeah. somebody to take me around. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's but who always knows fun. better than photographers who live there? Yeah. That's what we yeah. always say about the Everglades. Yeah. You know, we've got all these mm -hmm. people who come on our show and yeah. they're big famous photographers and they do Everglades tours. Yeah. But half the time you plan it for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I set up, lay out the trip and tell <laughs> like them just when come to with go. Us. And else, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, when I mm. went out to the Palouse two years ago. Yeah, well, you hired a guy. Uh, Jack Wayne out there who lives there. He yep. lives in the middle of the Palouse. He knows everybody. He's an accomplished photographer. Uh, so I had him. So he maximized my stay because it's a big area. I could have been driving around for days looking for this barn or that barn. He knew where to go, what time to go there. And it turned into a fabulous experience. In, in a short time, I got tremendous pictures because I had somebody who could get me to the places I needed to be at it yeah. at the time I needed to and be there. And then I just think about little things that you add to your photo tours in the Everglades, like going to Joni's Blue Crab and making yeah. sure, I can't remember the waitress's name, make sure you <laughs> get that waitress who's so funny. And yeah. that's things that people just don't know. Oh, yeah. We you have, know, you we have to great eat, places. Eat, what's the place? Eat? What's the place in Miami on your way back from the Everglades with the lime, key lime milkshakes? Oh, oh, Robert, Robert is here. Robert is here. Robert I mean, is those here are as the a, little yeah, things that yeah. people don't know oh, no, unless no, they no. Yeah, are if you're from local, the area. You know? you know, locals know that. Or, you know, and it makes it so much more sure fun. It that's a lot so, more fun. Yeah. And that's a fun place to photograph, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, what kind of gear do I need? I guess, I guess it depends on where I'm going, right? Yeah, well, oh, first off, we'll get back to that. Is it a, are you going with friends, you know, vacation, or is it a photo uh -huh. tour kind of thing. So if you're going with friends, you want to keep it real simple. So what I have is I have a uh, Panasonic Lumix LX100, mm -hmm. which is a, a relatively small camera. It has a micro four thirds sensor in it, although it doesn't use quite all of it. But it has a, the lens is a uh, equivalent of a 24 to 85 on a full frame camera, very fast lens. Okay. So I can use it at night. It's small, it's pocketable, it mm -hmm. takes an excellent picture. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it does a great time lapse, and I do a lot of time lapses yeah. on vacations. I have fun with that. I originally bought it uh, when I first started doing the Cuba trips to use at night when I wanted something simple. It's light, simple. So a camera like that. Sony has that uh, RX100 line. I don't know whether they're on five or six or seven. They crank out a new one every year. That's good. There's a lot of cameras like this. Panasonic has a couple other ones. Uh, Canon has some uh, uh, point and shoot type things that you can use. And they're fine. Or even uh, you could take a, uh, a super zoom because they're fairly small. Okay. Or a very light DSLR, uh, the Canon SL1, SL2, I think it yeah. is the current one. And that's real small. And if you put a simple lens on there, it's still light. It's getting bulkier though, but it's still light. So something like this, uh, keeping it simple. And, you know, you don't want to deal with a whole lot of interchangeable lenses or something. So one camera, one lens, and you're good to go when you're going with friends and family. And then you always have your backup camera, which is... It's the cell phone. Your cell phone. Your cell phone. <laughs> yeah, if it's simple enough and it's got a good enough cell phone, uh, I guess you could just take the cell phone these days, you know. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of people do. Uh, and then, of course, if it's a... Uh, if you're going to take photos, if that's the purpose of it, to go uh, document a place and record images there and what have you, then it's a whole different story. Okay. Then it's how much can you carry and put on the plane? Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and that can be a problem because yeah. you start going to third world countries and you start getting in small planes, there's weight limits. Yeah. And those weight limits sometimes are pretty severe. I used to have a uh, Pelican roll-on. Uh, which fit in the overhead. Okay. You know, they said it was a TSA approved size. I'll, I'll, I'll divert for just a minute. There is, TSA does not specify sizes for luggage. Okay. So there is no such thing. Even though as they a, all say that? Yeah, they all say that. <laughs> TSA has nothing to do with luggage sizes. Okay. They're just concerned with what's inside it. Uh -huh. So there isn't any TSA approved size. Who decides the size of your carry-on and everything else is the airline. Oh, okay. And that can vary from airline to airline. And it can also vary from plane type to plane type within oh. a specific airline. Oh. If you're going on a small puddle jumper, it may be much smaller because the overheads are smaller or maybe even non-existent, you know, where the under, under seat area is smaller. So that can change. So that just diverting for a minute there. If you're buying luggage, it's TSA approved. Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> the only thing that can be TSA approved these days is the locks. Okay. There are certain kinds of locks on the luggage yeah. that TSA has keys for, oh. which means everybody else at the airport does too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my okay, gosh. so so get it, so get back to uh, what you're carrying. So you're you're limited if you're if you're going someplace uh, where the weight restrictions are small, you're going to have to restrict what you're taking or downsize. Uh, I do know one couple though, uh, both have a photographers and on their honeymoon they went to Africa on vacation and wanted to take all their gear. So they had three tickets, one for him, one for her, and one for the camera gear in the other seat. Oh my An expensive gosh. way to go, but yeah, you know, it's expensive, uh. <laughs> an expensive, an expensive way to go, but but that's what they did. You know, wow. not too many people have the money to, to do that no on a trip kidding. like that. But, <laughs> but that's what they did. They got a third seat for oh their for their luggage. Gosh. I don't know why they did it for the whole trip or just on the. I think they just did it on the smaller planes when they got over there, oh, and they I did see. that. Not the international hop, but the the local stuff. I wow. think they did it for. But that's the way. The other thing you could do is, I mean, you could uh, have it. Uh, sent to you, you know, FedEx it or, or whatever the carrier is for that area. Of course, you know, you have to have a place to send it to. That's not good if you're traveling all over the place, but if you're going to one destination, yeah. you could always have it shipped. Okay. You know, not cheap again, but that's I mean, that's how idea. they ship things back and forth, so yeah. you can always do that. Uh, DHL is big in the Caribbean. You see their yellow and red trucks all over the place, so you could ship it that way. I have a friend who had stuff sent down to uh, St. Martin that way, okay. like DHL. Okay. You know? That was more because he needed it in an emergency, and he oh. had brought it with it, so his wife packed it up and sent it down to him. It was down there in two days, you know. So. I learned something that I thought was kind of that I didn't figure this out <laughs> because 
but I want to mention it in case there's other dum dums out there like me who mm -hmm. didn't think this through. So you know, we just I just went to Cuba a few weeks ago and uh, put all my gear in the backpack and weighed it to make sure it was less than whatever the weight was for your carry on. And I always wear a fanny pack when I travel. Very fashionable, I know. But anyway, Denise was with me, and she's like, boy, is that a rookie mistake. You bring another backpack, just a little smaller one for your, and you put mm -hmm. the fanny pack inside there yeah. so that you have more, You have basically, because you can have one small carry-on bag, but mm -hmm. it can be a pretty big, small bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that was my mistake, and because I could have brought more stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So and I I'll, brought a lot of stuff. I'll pack bags within bags, and maybe if need be, you can get one of these photographers' vests to wear it on the plane, and you know, yeah. it's just what you're carrying. You can stack a lot of stuff in there, you know. That's a good, good point. So, yeah. so what kind of gear do I need? All right. Well, it depends on where I'm going. Right? Depends on where you're going. So, so you know, you're you're going to use the gear you already have. The worst mistake you can buy, make, is buying something new to take on the trip. Okay. Not so much lenses, but camera bodies. Okay. Because it takes you a while to learn a camera body. And going on a trip when you're not going to go there again, and it's a once in a lifetime moment, is not the time to be learning the new camera. I agree. So you, you don't, and I, I, I can't tell you, and you know how many people do this. They buy a camera a week before the trip, and I'm at their house. And then they call us and them. say, oh, I think I should take the photography lesson because I'm going to Africa. Right. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. with my new camera. <laughs> yeah. And, and we get this all the time, you know, and we, we try to get it's them a in a position. It's a human thing to do. Yeah. So you, you want to take your old equipment. Now, a, a new lens or something, yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, that's because it, unless it's like a, a, a super telephoto or something like that because they take some technique in getting used to. But typically, you, would, you know, you, you might do that. But. That can be a little tough, but, but typically you want to use the equipment you already have. Okay. And you're going to be comfortable with that. And what that is is, well, it's, uh, you know, wide-angle lenses for landscapes is what everybody says. Mm -hmm. But truthfully, a lot of my landscapes are taken with telephoto lenses. And that was another mistake I made. I make them all. So I went to Tuscany. Mm -hmm. And Stefano lent me his uh, camera because he, he was a different. He was a Sony. I was yeah. a Canon. But I didn't have a. I didn't have a telephoto lens because yeah. I was thinking landscapes mm -hmm. in Tuscany. But no, no, no. You need a. You need a telephoto in yeah. Tuscany. You need to compress those right. mountains or hills or whatever mm -hmm. they're called. Yeah. I live in Florida. It's flat. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what those things are called. <laughs> anyway. And you do yeah. the same thing. The Palouse. When I'm out to the Palouse, I figure, oh, I'm not going to have to compress it, so I'll take my 400 millimeter lens because it's fairly light, and that's fine. You zoom. Okay, so I get that. I'm out there, and I'm going, I should have brought the 600. should have brought the 600 because no, I wanted to compress it more than even I did. More. Smokies, a lot of the pictures in the Smokies, you want to compress those mountain ranges. So uh, a decent telephoto helps. I mean, you could take like a 70 to 200 and an uh, extender for it, you know, because when you're taking a landscape, you don't have to worry about how fast the autofocus is or right. how much light you're using. So you could always do that and, and have multi-purpose lenses. Like that. And that's a way to save weight. And that's a way to save weight and have multi-purpose, you know. A good thing to take is one of these uh, universal wide zooms that goes from 18 to, a giz you know, 18 to 300. Or uh -huh. what Tamron has, I don't know what their latest one is, but they have unreal ranges. And they're pretty good optically. Okay. I mean, they're not as good as a super pro lens, but they're quite satisfactory for most stuff you so use. So depending on if you're just traveling and you love photography, yeah. but if you want to sell your work, do you need a better quality lens? Maybe. Maybe. You know, it's, it's a tough call. It depends. It, to, to be honest, if you can shoot at f8 with any lens, it's pretty good. Okay. I mean, it's only when you start opening the lens up that you really start to see the imperfections. You'll have some difference at f8, mm -hmm. but not a whole lot. It's when you start getting the wider apertures and things like that is where you start to see the difference. Okay. Uh, with all lenses, you're going to see a difference in contrast between the, the cheaper lenses and the better ones and yeah, okay. flare control and things like that. But sharpness, like I say, f8, you're, um, any modern lens is pretty good at f8. Okay. Good so, to know. So you want that. You want your other gear. You want comfortable camera bag or bags. 
-hmm. You were talking, you know, if you're taking a big suitcase, you can have an empty camera bag and put your clothes in it or, yeah. or whatever. That's what I do. Because I, I'll usually have two different bags depending. I might have a backpack and I might have a smaller shoulder bag or cross bag. So yeah. I'll have them, but I'll have other stuff in them. Yeah. You know, if I don't have my camera equipment in it, then I'll have other equipment in it to get to where I'm going. Well, that's what I did right. Yeah. I actually did have a cloth backpack in my suitcase. Okay. So on the way home, I used it for my mm -hmm. carry-on bag. But I, it's not a camera bag, but I, I just, I know, and maybe you're going to think this is weird, but I put bubble, I put my secondary camera in bubble wrap, and I put that in my backpack, the cloth ba backpack. First of all, it doesn't look like a, mm -hmm. a camera bag, so I'm not yeah. as, as uh, what, obvious, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. But it weighs so much less than a camera bags mm -hmm. are heavy. Yeah. Camera bags are heavy with nothing in them. It's the padding, that dense so foam. So I, uh, I use the camera bag to travel when I'm push, you know, putting yeah. it up in the bin and all that kind of stuff because I don't want my stuff to get wrecked. But if I'm just carrying it on my back, I'm pretty careful with it, you mm -hmm. know. So I have a second camera, which, um, you know, I carried that big old lens around on our walk through Vinales, and boy, that really paid off having that extra camera with yeah. that lens. I got that cool dog and cat shot, mm -hmm. and you know. So, the other place, though, when I went to Paris, I did not have a wide enough lens. And, you know, Isabel had told me, you need a, the wider, the better, the wider, the better. And I didn't even own a super wide lens. Yeah. And so I ended up stitching a lot of photos. So I would just go click, 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 take three shots and mm -hmm. stitch them later. Oh, because you can, and you can do that. It's, it takes post-processing, but you have a better image that way. Really, if you think about it, you have more pixels in the image. So yeah. you know, have more better resolution if you do that. Well, I ended up doing that a lot, and I probably will never process all my Paris <laughs> pictures because of it, because there's so many that need to be stitched. Yeah. But I did some. Yeah. In fact, I gave her a gift. She mm -hmm. took me, Isabel took me, and um, oh, I forgot the name of this garden. It was amazing, and I did the same thing. I just did okay. a pano and stitched yeah. this garden. It was so beautiful. And there's software you can automate it. to do that that will do batch and do it in batches. I can't think of names offhand, but yeah, I you probably, some of that. But yeah. if I were organized. Mm -hmm. You know, I do three shots, one, one, three shots, one, yeah, three shots. Yeah. So it's not organized. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just can't run them through. Yeah. Oh. So you need, you to feel like you need a wide angle lens, a, a, a telephoto yeah. lens of some sort, yeah. and then a walk around lens if you can. And is that a good rate? Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you want to cover everything, there's what they call the Holy Trinity for a full frame. Okay. And that's a, a 16 to 35, a 24 to 70, and a 70 to 200. That's the photojournalist's go-to okay. range. And if you have those three, you've covered pretty much Everything. any circumstance. All right. Okay, but you can move that around. Instead of a 70 to 200, take a 100 to 400. Yeah. Instead of a 24 to 70, uh, my favorite for full frames is 24 to 105. Yeah. And that's, that's like a walk around lens. That's a I can, great I can travel yeah. lens. And, you know, 16 to 35, 17 to 40, whatever, something like that. I've gotten away from taking the fast 2.8 lenses, too. Because they're too dang heavy. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, typically, the reason I was carrying a 2.8 was for low light, not for depth of field control, more for low light. Mm -hmm. But with the modern cameras that the ISOs you can shoot, I'll take F4s. And the F4 lenses are like half the size and weight of yeah. the... Yeah. Of, the, of the f2.8 so uh, you know uh, so it's a big difference and optically they're just as good now what else because we've we've only this is only we're on number are we number two or three i think we're on number two yeah or we three. Gotta, okay we let's take move this along gear. All right. oh, <laughs> so well the next the next thing is uh for equipment that's about it you well, know you this need stuff, a tripod yeah. you need a tripod most places it's good to take a tripod cable release maybe a flash for at night depends on what you're going to be shooting. I always take a tripod because you have a lot of places inside where you can use one. You have a lot of places inside where you can't. So mm -hmm. you should know that in your research ahead of time. Uh, cable release obviously to go with that. Some lens cleaning costs. Lots of batteries. Lots mm -hmm. of lots of memory cards. Uh, chargers. All that kind of stuff. If you're going with friends, it's great if you have the same kind of equipment because mm -hmm. you can swap chargers or share chargers and things like that. Yeah. Share equipment too, you know. You can split lenses up and take like that. That's pretty much it for the equipment. 
the big thing from there is, is, is taking the photos. And from there, you should know something about composition. Now, we okay. don't want to turn this into a composition course, but you know, know the rule of thirds, know when to break it, uh, know, know simple things like if you're doing landscapes, uh, you want to create dimension, you want to create depth in your landscape, and you do that by having foreground objects, mid-ground objects, background objects, so you can step into the scene and you create a three-dimensional look okay. in that flat two-dimensional print. So be careful of the lighting. Lighting is everything when you're doing it. So the time of day is going to make a big difference. Something can look entirely different first thing in the morning than it does at midday right. or at sunset. So you want to figure when you want to go to a place, what you want the lighting to be. Uh, and typically most of your shots is going to be the, the couple hours in the morning, couple hours in the evening when you're getting your best light for landscape shots. Mm -hmm. When you get into more uh, in towns and people, uh, if they're in the shade, you can shoot them pretty much any time you want. Uh, same thing with buildings during the day, because typically in a big city, half the stuff's in shadow and half yeah. the stuff's in sunlight all the time, unless it's an overcast day. So you're not as limited to, certainly it's going to look better under a golden glow of morning or evening, but right. you can shoot a lot during the day too. Uh, when you're shooting landscapes, uh, we like triangles, so you build on triangles with trees and mountains and things like that okay. and try and get triangles into your shot compositionally. Uh, things like that are a big help. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, uh, with landscape, you want a leading lines to take you through it. Okay. And you don't want to build a fence. You want to have a hole in the, I was telling you, layers. Uh -huh. Well, the foreground layer, you want some kind of opening in it so your eye can go in and go through back to the middle layer and back to the back, whether that's right. a C so you curve don't want or an S curve. Like, like a horizontal something right in right. front of the picture. Right. I don't want something that my eye has to climb can... over. You've got to go through it. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's an important thing. And then you can shift around a little bit. So these are the kind of simple, look at the colors. What colors are good to go with what? One thing I do... Um, when I'm photographing and I want to get people in the shot wherever I go, when I start walking around, I'm looking at what will make a good background. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a really cool wall. I like the color. This door is really interesting or this fence. And I'll be looking at them as I'm walking around. So when I find somebody interesting to photograph and I go up and ask them if I can take their photograph and they say yes, now they're committed. And they're doing that because they want their photograph taken. And then I can say, well, it'll look a lot better if we go right over here. Mm -hmm. Now, mine, we're not, we're not hopping far, a bus and taking yeah, them the yeah. other <laughs> side of town. You know, but we're, instead of taking it here, let's move 20 feet over here, and we'll have a much better graph gown for you, and it's going to look much better. And they're willing to take the photograph. And when you show that interest that it can be a better photograph you do there, 99% of the time, they're going to be willing to go over there, and, and it makes a much better shot. Yeah, that's and that's great. something people don't do. They just usually take it right where it is. I know. But if the person said yes, now you're showing them that you're really interested in this being a good shot, and you're saying it will be better if we do this, and of course they're going to do it. Right. That's and then, of course, advice. afterwards now, it's great today with digital cameras. You can show them right on the back what it is, and you can show them. Of course, you don't have the ooh and ah factor you did years and years ago, because everybody has a cell phone, even in the most yeah. remotest place, you know. <laughs> so it isn't like, oh, an image on a screen, how do you do that? It's magic. You know, we're well past that, but they still like seeing the photograph, and you can build up a rapport with them and talk to that. Also, when you're dealing with people, and I think this jumps to another tip, <laughs> and, I, and I think we're in another tip now with that, uh, you want to, you, you don't just shoot a person and run typically. If you want a good picture, uh, you want to develop a relationship with them. So you want to talk okay. to them a little bit. Okay. You want to be interested in what they're doing. And that shows. And, it, and the reaction is good from that. Now, a lot of people are shy and they so. afraid to approach strangers. Uh -huh. Well, there's a way to get yourself into this. Okay. Start by taking pictures of people whose job it is to have their photograph taken. You go to a place, there's reenactors, or there's costume characters, okay. or this and that. In that's Cuba, their there's costume people, yeah. and that, you know, people walking that, around, that's, and that's, that's what that's they, their business. they want to make money. That, that's their <laughs> business. You know, and a little tip, 
or whatever, or you go to a place, a historic place, and there's people usually dressed up in costumes. Well, they expect to have their picture taken. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they do. That's what they want to do. So, of course, they're going to say, oh, sure, because it's their job. So that gets you used to talking to people and learning that. And then from here, you can step up the people that aren't necessarily costume people, but people that are in the tourist trade. Uh, the chef cooking the, the, mm -hmm. the food outdoors mm -hmm. or, or the maitre d' or the person in front of the hotel or the cab driver or whatever. People that are involved in the travel industry are also going to be amenable to having their pictures taken. Oh, good point. So you yeah. get used to it more. And then from there you can go to approaching people on the street. Now, if a person looks friendly, chances are they are. Yeah. And it's not a problem. But the guy that's kicking the dog down the street <laughs> probably isn't. So don't bother asking him. You know, but you can get into it this way. And you, you get used to it. Now, some people are going to say no. Yeah, uh, yeah. When I go to Cuba, there is, uh, there is one guy there, a vegetable cart, and he doesn't want his picture yeah, taken ever, yeah. so I don't even bother to ask him. Right. So, and so, you have to be respectful yeah. to people, too. Yeah, yeah. So now are you talking about telling a story when you're talking about yeah. the people? Yeah. Uh, this, this is important, too. Anywhere you go travel, you're documenting your travel. Okay. So think of it as a motion picture. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a movie or a book and you're trying to tell a story. So it has to have openings, middle, end. So if, if you watch how you develop a, a movie, okay, you have opening shots where you're showing maybe a, a pan of the whole thing, okay? okay? So you're, you're taking overall shots of where you go. Uh -huh. uh, and then from there, you're gonna take mid shots of uh, 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 smaller things instead of a big wide vista maybe you're cutting down and now you're taking a picture of some buildings or some trees or a stream or something like that and then from there you're going into more details the people or or their clothing or okay. bric-a-brac in a shop or something like this signs take photos of signs to tell you where it is you're you are you oh, know that's a good idea <laughs> here we are here and that helps too when you, later when you're trying to figure out you went on one of these cruises eight islands in seven days <laughs> and you're trying to figure out where it was you know you have a picture of a sign so you know so you're building a story with uh, the why the middle and then and have an ending you know that here we are leaving that kind of thing and you can do this for each thing you go. You do it for the overall, right? but you can do it for one building. Let's say you're going to photograph a church. Okay. So you have the outside of the church. Uh -huh. And then you have maybe the main aisle of the church. Uh -huh. And then maybe you have a close-up of the altar or some of the uh, statues or whatever is in there or candles or whatever else is in the church or place of worship. And, and you get the details on these. So you're, you're progressing right. and telling a story by it. Yeah, that's, yeah. A great, that's great advice. All right, so tell a story, and we, we only have a few more minutes, so okay. I want to get through them all. So number six is capture the uniqueness, is that what, yeah, you, yeah, what you do you mean want, by well, that? The things that are different about it. Uh, maybe they have some kind of festival that goes on there. Uh, okay. In Key West, they have a festival called Fantasy Fest. Uh -huh. uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, New Orleans has Mardi Gras. Uh -huh. uh, there's a... Uh, a rotor, uh, the rodeo in Calgary, I believe, in Canada, right? I think that's where it is. There's a big I rodeo out there. I think, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's Calgary. I could be mistaken, but okay. there's a big rodeo out there. Uh, there's all kinds of special events and places that you can take. Other things can be unique to the area. Uh, American alligators in the Everglades. I was going to say, that's know. what we have. We've got uh, alligators. You, got, you bears, have to get a picture yeah, of an alligator polar bears, when you come polar here. Polar bears in the Arctic. Uh, people uh, dress in unusual costumes or unusual things. All these things that are unique to a place. Okay. Things that make it different. Uh, things that you don't find anywhere else. And these are things you can take photographs of. Okay. You know, things like that. That's, that is really good. Yeah. Something that says where you are. Yeah, You're in Florida, you need a picture of an orange, <laughs> an alligator, whatever, you know. St. Croix, we have pictures of the beer drinking pig. <laughs> you gotta have that, and the fire dancers, right? And the fire Kiki. dancers, yeah. <laughs> if you go to- In uh, Cuba, you have to have a cigar, somebody smoking somebody a cigar. Somebody have to smoke in a cigar, things like that. So cool. things that are unique to a place or, or associated with it. And this also helps you tell the story. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're trying to tell the sure. story and, and, yeah. the, and, you know, connecting with people was one mm -hmm. of your tips. That's tell, helping tell the story, yeah. you know, um, 
and the iconic things to take yeah, pictures exactly. of is, is telling the story. So let's, so. That's another thing. You said iconic, and that's one thing to touch on. A lot of people go someplace and they'll say, oh, I didn't take the picture of the Eiffel Tower because everybody does that. <laughs> or I didn't take the picture of this because everybody does that. Well, oh my gosh. Yeah, they do, but you should too. Because especially if you're trying to tell a story and you're going to show these pictures to somebody later, they're going to expect to see that. Yeah. I mean, the best thing I, I can say about that is uh, Oxbow Bend out in the, out in the T Yellowstone River, Oxbow Bend out there in the Tetons. It's probably one of the most photographed landscapes out there. And pretty much everybody takes it from the same vista within 30 feet of each other. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was in Clyde Butcher's gallery after he'd been out there. He was, a couple of years ago, he went out there and did a tour out there. One of the best pictures he has in there is the picture everybody else has. His has better light and everything, okay? But he took the same picture everybody else did, what I call a tripod hole shot. It's been shot by so many people on tripods, they've dug holes <laughs> in the ground from it. Take that shot too. And then move get around, your, move around yeah. and, and make your unique one. But get those iconic yeah. shots as well. I think that I agree with you completely. Yeah. All right, so let's recap. So the okay. first one I already forgot. What would we talk? What was the well, first tip? Managing expectations. Managing, was the first thing. yeah. So yeah. What, what's this photo trip? What's this trip about? Is it for photographers exactly. or is it for vacation mm -hmm. and, and plan accordingly? Right. So number two was planning and research. Yeah, right, and that's a big thing. And that's the biggest. That's going to make and break your, your trip. Number three was I forgot. Tell the story. <laughs> Tell the no. That was I think that was four, but uh, three we were uh, gear. Oh, the gear. Of we we're course. talking about the gear. The gear. Yeah. Tell the story. Tell the story. And with tell the story comes connect with people. Yeah. Composition. Oh, and Com composition. yeah, we had composition, connecting with okay. people. Uh, what's unique about it? What's unusual about it? And, and get back to that. I mentioned all these fairs and festivals. That's another thing to look at when you're doing the research and planning for two reasons. Maybe you want to go when the festival's there. And maybe you want to go when the festival isn't there yeah. because it's too crowded when the festival's there. I, I, okay. That's why when we so, do the Mount Dora trip, we, we don't do the weekends. Yeah. We get there Friday because we want to go to the Antique Mark, but Saturday and Sunday it's just too crowded, you yeah. know, during well, season. So. <laughs> same, thing, same thing with our St. Augustine adventures in the spring. Mm -hmm. We always look at what weekend the birding and photo fest is and we'll pick the weekend before or afterwards because that weekend is a zoo. It's crazy, yeah. I mean it's a great thing but it's not what you want if you want to go there and do a workshop. It's right. too crowded. Yeah. So you want to look at that too. All you right. want to check out all that. Now, um, okay, so you've got this weekend coming up that, which is the Florida Camera Club Council Conference. And trade show. Oh, and trade show. <laughs> <laughs> And this is March 8th through the 10th, 2019. Yes. So right. that's your, you're kind of all consumed with that right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. It's right? crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, got some big name speakers. So people still can yeah. come, right? Do yes. Still people can still buy tickets. Uh, and the trade show is free. If some, if local people are, are watching, they right? can just you can, come you to can the come trade show. You can come to the trade show, show for free. And where, where is this? Uh, this is at Florida Gulf Coast University and uh, Fort and Myers mailing address. Okay. Okay. It's on the southern edge of Fort Myers. So it's almost in... Estero. Estero. Yeah, because yeah. I thought it was Estero. <laughs> no, it's, it's Fort Myers on the okay. mailing address. But, but so it's local great. people, if they want to go, Hunt's photo and video yeah. is going to be Hunt's there. Is I know. Be there. Yeah. So you can go and pick up. If you want a new camera, new mm -hmm. lens, something like yeah. that, you can go to Hunt's yeah. and, and Sigmund, shop. Yeah, Sigma and Tamarum will be there, so you can play with all their lenses. Play with the lenses. That's uh, awesome. If you're coming to the conference itself, bring your camera because we're going to have, in addition to a dozen famous speakers. Uh, throughout the course of the weekend. We're going to have different kinds of models there to photograph. We're going to have all kinds of tabletop setups to photograph. Okay. So we're going to have a lot of things to shoot. Ooh, maybe uh, I'll bring my camera. Yeah, and also... Uh, Do I get to come in if I'm a speaker? I didn't buy a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I get a free ticket? You get a free ticket. <laughs> and uh, Southern Photo will be there cleaning cameras as well. Oh. Yeah. I knew that and I forgot and my cameras are filthy. Yeah. Thank you for reminding yeah. me. Now Isaac will be there from Southern Photo and he'll be cleaning the sensors and everything so you can get the sensors done there while drop it off, go to a couple of classes and come back. I better put that on my Facebook. Have it nice and, nice and shiny. But and then your next trip, your next photo workshop is when? 
next photo workshop is St. Augustine. Well, yeah, that you have openings for, I should uh, that, say. Well, I have St. Augustine out. in April, and that is sold out. It's been sold out for quite some time. And then in May, we'll be going up to the forgotten, what we call the Forgotten Coast Tour uh, workshop, which is the Apalachicola region of Florida. That's a fabulous trip. It's all old Florida. Although there was a lot of hurricane damage up in that area, the particular area we go to came away pretty unscathed. So people that are afraid that it's all they're going to find is flat level ground. No, that's not the case in the areas we go to. Yeah. Uh, we also spend a morning out on the Dead Lakes, which is just awesome. It's this huge, gigantic lake. I forget how many acres it encompasses, but it's filled with these uh, dead cypress stumps, nice. really huge ones. We're talking stumps that are five, seven, eight feet in diameter that stick up maybe eight, ten feet out of the water. Some of them are coming back, but you get out there on this lake and there's all this stuff to photograph it's and it's amazing. Uh, the person that runs the boat is a photographer himself. So uh, between him and me, we get you right in the right space and the right light and we move around so you can get just the absolute perfect shots. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. It's, that's and a when lot is of fun. that? Uh, that is May. I don't have the date right in front of me. Oh, uh, you don't know either. I thought no. maybe, I didn't remember the date no. either, but I knew it was in May. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for being okay. the guest number 130 on My the pleasure. Understand Photography Show. Um, and I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can watch this on YouTube, Facebook, or listen to us as a podcast. It's a long show. It's an hour-long show, so sometimes it's a little easier to listen to. Uh, it's why we don't have visuals, because we have a much larger audience on, as, on the podcast than we do on our YouTube and Facebook channels. So um, subscribe. Subscribe to us. Write us a review on iTunes if you enjoy the show. And just keep, keep watching. Keep listening. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for watching episode 130 of the Understand Photography Show.